moved. Um, in 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 what way? Like, like, do you mean? Um, uh, yeah, removed was a really poor choice of word. But but to be honest, that day my brain wasn't working at all. Um, well, I'm actually I'm actually more concerned about the not concerned, but I'm just uh, what's confusing is what do you mean by altering? Because that could mean anything, I guess. And so I'm just wondering what you mean exactly by by like yes. Changing. For example, when you're angry about something and you take a walk, uh, I've learned just recently that that helps the adrenaline inside your body, your hormonal um, reaction to, to the angerment, to be easy to deal with. Because um, apparently adrenaline can only be wear it out. So let's say that if you go running for 10 minutes, it's usually easier for your body to process the whole adrenaline situation. Um, so a, let's say that let's say that you could, for example, you are in a really angry angry situation. You could alter a little bit the physical aspect of that angerment by taking a walk or moving somehow. Uh, that could reduce the, the the passion to a handle point. Let's say. Hmm. I like that example because I go running a lot and. <laughs> You know, it's a funny instinct I have that um, if it's a, uh, a stressful day at work or I'm I'm angry, uh, it 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 does, it does help to run. Actually, when I run, um, I um, I think a lot when I run. I, I visualize a lot when I run, and I visualize very specific situations. Like if I'm dealing with something in life, it's habitual at this point. Like I I, I run every week that it just happens and it doesn't happen. I was talking to my friend who also runs and um, there's a point in running because for the first 10 or 15, for the first, uh, maybe you, you, you do visualize and you think about these things in the first like 15 minutes. After 20 minutes though, you stop thinking. Your body's just exhausted. It's continuing to run, but it just, it, it's, it's exhausted itself. Um, but for the first 15 to 20 minutes, that visualization really helps. And I think that coupled with the fact that you just feel so exhausted, I think you're right. I think you're, it's a really, it's a really interesting point um, that your body just can't, um, uh, probably can't handle like the adrenaline. It's, it's, that's, that's run out, but it's also, it's, it's, I guess it's just exhaustion too. If, if your body's physically exhausted, it's not going to, it's not going to feel like there's any point in being exhausted or for anything emotionally yeah. also your but your brain usually helps to focus on the on the present things kind of like the not not just present but kind of like the, the things that are pressing to your body hunger mm. um i think victor frankl also creates this really nice uh, uh idea that when you're hungry you all that you can think of is food right so um if we move a little bit that concept, we, we could say that the most pressing thing, in this case, your body being exhausted, will be the, the thing that will force you to focus, let's say. Your, your brain will force you to focus on the fact that you're tired and you should stop, right? That's also the problem of, of runners. You, you want to keep moving, but your brain is telling you, please stop doing this because it's killing me. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Tony. Hey, how's it going, guys? Good, good. How are you doing? Yeah, very good, thank you. Very good. It's been a good day. How about for you? Uh, myself. Um, all right. I can't complain. Um, yeah, I'm doing all right. You, you look a bit. You, you look a bit younger today, Steve. Uh, there's something different about you. Can't quite work out what it is. <laughs> About half the weight of my head just fell oh, off. Oh, sorry. Maybe that's it. Maybe that's it. Hey, is there a prerequisite here to have facial hair? I think it's only the girls who don't have facial hair. Hmm. Everybody else does. It's hard to it's hard to tell sometimes because uh, Eva's never Eva's never um <laughs> never showing her face. Uh, who knows? Um, uh, but you know, yeah, yeah. It's um. Uh, Gonzalo, for some reason, I can't imagine in my head. I can't. I don't know. I see you every week, but I can't remember if you have facial hair. I don't know. I seem to remember that he does. Okay. 
A little bit, yeah. I think it may, maybe a, l- a little bit scruff like you, Tony. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, maybe. It, 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 it would come off in the wind if I just put my head out the car window. Yeah, uh, there it is. Yeah, just come off. <laughs> oh, I'm just a bit tardy. Usually I, I shave. Oh, okay. Okay. I think it's a, everyone's going to lock down facial hair of some description. Yeah. You're on mute, Gonzalo. Ah, yeah. Uh, to, to be really honest, I let my facial grow hair because my perception when I'm shaved, it's like I'm five years old. So it's like I'm allowed to do more silly things. And yeah. I wish I could say the same, Gonzalo. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not the case for me. <laughs> you look... Uh... Uh, you look just as just as young or old either either way. I just look as unfortunately as old as what I am. <laughs> There's no benefit at all. <laughs> what is it? Four oh two four oh three. Okay. Um I didn't see too many too many replies to this on, on either the website or, or meetup. Uh so I'm not sure who else is attending. Um I would assume Abdul, maybe a little bit late he comes, just because he's he's been really into um, uh, es- mm, mm, interested in talking about the passions and how to deal with them. And maybe Philip. I think Philip is active today because I saw he posted something new in in the forum on on the website, some some a book review on a biography of Seneca. Hmm. So I'm not sure if he's attending, and I think Ava is going to be late. So um, we can begin. Um, we all know each other. This is quite nice. Um, uh, it's quite nice to have a set of regulars with you guys. It really is yeah. nice. Um, and it's it's going to be a little bit uh, uh, um, sad, not in the in the passion uh, passionate sense, but in the um, in the uh, looking back sense. Um, that when we go out of lockdown, we're going to be meeting more in person without seeing. Tony or, or Gonzalo's uh, face. Um, I'd, I'd say that was a blessing for me personally, Steve. If you, if you don't see my face, then it's a blessing for you. <laughs> <laughs> so um, just a general question, but I, I know if you guys um, know this drill already, do you guys mind being recorded? No. No? Okay. Okay. So we're live now. Um, and today's topic is a deep dive into the passions. Uh, thank you, Gonzalo, for submitting a light frog for today, um, a prompt for today. Uh, I had a couple others um, just to run down the list and we can kind of start anywhere. Um, I'm going to say yours, Gonzalo, but maybe you want to maybe we touch upon it first. Uh, or um, I think before we get into the prompts, in any case, I'll, I'll list out the prompts. But before we get into the prompts, maybe we discuss a little bit about the readings. But the prompts uh, were, and I created three of them. Gonzalo's yours was, does altering just one of the components in the passions formula will be enough to consider a passion removed? Uh, and then I asked a couple of others because I hadn't seen anybody else submit any. And I asked, how do we know what we are feeling is either an indifferent rational emotion, those those three uh, indifferent passions that that was discussed, wish, um, prudent caution, and and joy. And and then the other question is, how do we practically do it? How do we practically remove or extirpate, they said, the passions? I also asked another question about that. I asked a question, um, hi, Abdul. I asked a kind of um, corollary to that, and it was, is there one method to remove all the passions, or do we need to treat each passion uniquely and separately, which I thought would be interesting to go to, maybe connected to that, how do we practically remove uh, the passions from our our mind? Um, But just a general question, does anybody, would anybody like to open up the discussion with a point or a comment or a review of what they had read? and what they thought about as they were reading it. Um, Gonzalo. 
yes, I think that it was really helpful for me, the link with, um, let's say, this slight explanation about what it, each passion is a little bit about. Um, I think that sometimes in my Latin brain, the, the one that I'm talking about precisely is, wait, I forgot it here. Um, I will post it on the chat. Uh, it has a small description. It, it has the, the word in English, a small description, and then the word in Greek and Latin. Uh, for me, at least, um, half of my brain thinks in Spanish. Uh, I think that's, um, that was really helpful to, let's say, reshape the way that I use the words. Um, and because of that small reshape, that helped a lot into, um, let's say, removing a little bit of energy of those uh, words, because I felt like I was using them wrong in order to describe what's going on uh, internally. And I think that just that small step uh, worked a lot for me into, let's say, wearing the passion down. Um, Yeah, that that for me too. I really like the descriptions. I was trying to find I was trying to find out because that's a very generic web page, and I wasn't sure if the you. I mean, for me, I'm always unsure about the reliability of a, of a web source, but I, I think we could rely on it. There was um, when I searched for uh, uh, Jan or Jan Garrett at WKU. It seems like Jan or Jan Garrett. Dr. Jen Garrett is a emeritus professor uh, at Western Kentucky University in the U.S. So I think it's there's no description about her uh, or his um, uh, background. It just says emeritus faculty um, in the depart at the Department of Philosophy and Religion at the university. So I'm pretty sure. Uh, and yeah, you're right. I really like the. Um, I was really interested in the Greek and Latin too because I noticed there were a lot of words that. I know I, I know from English that were completely exact like almost exactly what they what they said in Greek or Latin and what was always what was also interesting was thinking about how we use it um, uh, like um, a, a good one if um, was yeah this one was really good it was interesting was um, uh, when they talked about the passion of delight. And they listed three. I'm, I'm I'm pretty sure there are probably more um, because it does say under rapture. It says that they have the Stoics list uh, passions for all the other force, other all these senses. Um, but um, under uh, delight, there's a specific kind of delight called malice, and the Latin word is related to the English word malevolent. Um, and I just. It, that was really interesting to me because I never thought of malevolent, malevolent like that or using the word malevolent. Whenever I heard malevolent that in English, that just means evil. But I guess um, <laughs> um, as a kid, I, I grew up, my family grew up with the Disney cartoon movies. And um, there's a, there's a, um, the Disney cartoon Snow White, the villain is named um, malevolent or, or malevolence or, or, or something like that. And, um, in Spanish, it's Maléfica, so it's... <laughs> maybe, yeah, okay, okay. And um, it, it, did, it did click to me that they used it in the, in the right way when the description was delight derived from another's evil. And the, the image I had was her laughing when she did something evil to somebody else. And that was, um, that really captured for me um, what, it, what they meant by this passion. So yeah, I really liked the, the Latin and Greek here. It was really, really good. Um, you don't have to raise your hands, by the way. We're five of us. I think for now we can we can just freely speak. Um, but if any more come on board, I'll ask everybody to um, raise their hands. Um, what did anybody else think of the sources or any other text or recommendations you guys would like to make? I think one interesting aspect for me was this notion of entrenched this, uh, dispositions rather than it just being a passion. Um, it can be actually be part of the psyche. It can be part of our culture. And that really says a lot to me. Um, I come from Liverpool and generally people who come from Liverpool are very emotional people. 
Um, they tend to just be ruled by their emotions, like most of my family is. Um, so that really spoke to me. It's not so much a passion, but it seems to be an entrenchment in the psyche of not just an individual, but an overriding aspect of the culture, a local culture. So that was quite an interesting aspect for me personally. Um, and how that should be managed is the next part <laughs> um, that I'd like to find out more about. Thanks, Tony. Um, yeah, it's, um, I couldn't really quite place, um, this was a good article and I, I want to read the book now. Like after reading the article, I kind of want to read Nussbaum's, um, the author that, that the book review was on, Nussbaum's book um, and that specific chapter maybe on the Stoic passions. Um, and that's actually a two part article. Uh, I noticed that in the, um, I, I actually just noticed yesterday that, and I, I was trying to find it, that that article uh, for medium is the first part. Uh, and he, he writes a second part, um, which I'll post for next week. We can do a two part series on the passions and we can maybe read that for next week as well as part of a, an ongoing understanding of the passions. Um, but I have to read that book now. I really, yeah, that really made it clear because I always understood the passions as different from emotions. Um, uh, per perhaps as a way in English to differentiate between what they understood as the passions and those emotions that were, um, I think, a, a good way of understanding it in the article or, or um, no, I think it was in the other article in the in the list of all the table list of all the passions. And they describe them as indifferent passions or sage passions, the the mm, the wish, joy, and caution um, that you should still have and retain. Um, I, I always wondered if there was, how, how do you distinguish between the passions and something that is acceptable that you could use rationally? Um, and that really made it clear. Um, if there's nobody else, I, I, I also wanted to point out what really struck out to me personally was um, uh, the fact that everything was cognitive, um, that there was no mental distinction between how your brain processes rational thoughts and how your brain processes uh, emotional thoughts, um, which to me makes a lot of sense. It actually it actually falls in line with um, actually the second part. This is why um, I'll post this in on the website and on Telegram. The second article on Stoic therapy and that on Medium, but. Um, he he also goes into detail about modern cognitive theory and psychological research on the unconscious and conscious mind. And what he says is that actually, um, you know, recently uh, a lot of cognitive scientists have been learning that a lot of what we do is automatic and, and unconscious. Like the word conscious, we only become conscious of it after we do it. Like we only become conscious of what we're actually going to do once the unconscious mind decides what to do. It's actually really interesting that most of what we do is just unconscious. Um, but I actually don't think that's a contradiction to, he says that might be a contradiction for stoicism, but I don't think that's entirely true. I think um, I think that falls somewhat in line with Chrysippus's kind of theory that everything is ra everything is not rational, but everything is comes from the rational cognitive mind, even the emotions and the passions. Um, uh, that um, the emotions are not some irrational force you can't control, um, that they are something you can control. Um, it also it also makes sense that the Stoics then understood that you could never completely get rid of them. There were always those small little impressions you could have day to day that you could never account for, understandable. Um, and they understood that even the wise sage is going to have some of those every now and then. The point is catching it when it happens. Um, mm -hmm. And to, to be honest, for me, it was really, I could, let's say, create the bridge between what I've learned in mindfulness slash Buddhism related to really um, trying to create a space in order to observe what you're, what you're thinking um, and, and kind of like what you're feeling at the same time but just as, a, as an observation, kind of like not not try to judge it in some in some way. Just try to 
try to create a space in order to identify when these automat automatic thoughts appear in your in your brain and and my um my mindfulness teacher slash um buddhist master used to say uh if you focus too much on a thought that will create um let's say the, the rest of the, of the rest of the body will will start to follow that thought let's say so if if you suddenly feel um you you suddenly have a, um a thought that you are in danger let's say um if if you catch it at first and say huh okay i can deal with that fear it will not trigger the rest of the system inside your your body that will trigger something like uh, an anxiety response or a cortisol response or adrenaline response in order for you to to let's say uh, keep running or because that's kind of like how the, our primal brain works you you um, imagine something and then you're ready in, to act because you don't know if the, that uh, I don't know, spot that you have seen in the jungle is an animal or not. Uh, and, and I think that, that that's kind of like in, inside my brain, all those three things are completely mixed up. They are the same thing. Uh, you cannot control the fact that you have, let's say, confused a dot with an animal. And But if you catch it, you will not be in this state where, where it's easy for you to run and then anything will trigger you to to start running or or, or some reaction uh, you will catch it and you will act before that reaction uh, and if you let's say observe it and for too long and it's already there you will say oh, okay this um, anxiety or this shaking or anything that i have it's because i had this thought and you could slowly um go back to a normal state or or create some action um, like the ones that we were talking at the beginning um, that it will basically um, help you to not to react but to act on the thing that you're are thinking let's say I'm not sure if that was clear yeah I think it, it was it was clear and I couldn't stop uh, thinking about uh this um, TED talk uh, I, I linked. Um, Lisa Feldman um, uh, Barrett, um, she's a psychologist. And what, she, what uh, she's saying is that um, emotions do not exist. Um, there, there are um, like bodily reactions that happen but emotions are 100% our interpretations of these bodily reactions. And I don't know if it's <laughs> like connecting re re really well or uh, going against uh, um, the stoic um, uh, perception, but I embraced uh, this uh, understanding of emotions and it really helped me uh, dealing, to deal with them. Um, especially, um, especially with uh, anxiety. Yeah. Mm -hmm. No, I don't think it's a, um, it's a contradiction. I think it's optional. I don't think it necessarily has to fit with stoicism, but I think it's a good... Mm, a reason why the Stoic philosophy could work. Like, for example, um, there is, a, I mean, it's, it's, um, I think only through practice where the early Stoics, like Chrysippus, were, were able to understand that the passions were under our control. Um, you know, they, they started practicing and then they realize this could be true. Um, but I think going so deep as to say that the emotions don't exist um, was something that they, they may not have considered. I'm not really sure because it, I guess, um, 
Um, yeah, I mean, I guess it, it depends on what you mean by emotion. You're right. I mean, if you, um, I, I read this book on, um, cause I, I wanted to read a, um, I've never read anything purely feminist and I was reading a, a feminist book by a, um, now deceased, um, poet and she talks very specifically about, um, this is, there's there's no connection between this book, at least on the surface, there's no connection between this book and stoicism. And there's, she doesn't espouse any stoic principles, but that's not the point. Um, and I think the point I'm trying to make is that um, she writes about emotions, not emotionally. Um, she doesn't say that, um, she doesn't argue that they should, for example, um, a history of um, discrimination against women and a female sense of emotion is not, um, uh, you should, because people are falsely treating emotions as just that. Whereas when women try to exercise their emotions, they're not exercising their emotions emotionally. I mean, perhaps sometimes they exercise them um, emotionally for good reason, but um, emotion kind of becomes literary. It becomes politically active. It becomes a sense of trying to act rationally, prudently, in order to make change. Because I think no matter what you think stoically, there's a point to which some political activism is, is good. You require to help move the world, move, you know, make, make change in society. And I think that, that also falls in line with what you're saying, is that um, at base, maybe emotions shouldn't be treated as just that, as some wily, irrational thought and crazy thought that you shouldn't have anymore. It should be thought of either as something in that kind of literary, political, or other kind of cultural dimension, or um, it should be treated like what you said. It's just kind of uh, an aesthetic interpretation of what you're feeling, but um, nothing more. I think it does fall in line. I think it's an agreement, not necessary. Again, I, like I said, not necessary for the Stoics to believe, but I, I would, um, as an, I guess, an interpretation of what she's saying. Yeah, I would, I would understand. I would agree with it. It makes sense. It, it helps you too. To I also, um, I think it could help. And just as a last word, I think it could help. It, it could also be negative. So, for example, it could help in trying to uh, relink, trying to relinquish. Um, uh, you're trying to control the passions and instead um, letting them fade away, like Gonzalo was saying. And I think, um, um, oh, I forget his name now, <laughs> the uh, Scottish uh, cognitive behavioral therapist. Um, John Robertson. Yeah, thank you, Robertson. Um, uh, he, he talks about in CPT that um, trying to control or focus your thoughts on these is not practical. What you should do is relinquish control, accept that they exist. And then, can, so for what I'm saying is, is that sometimes perhaps not admitting that they exist may be negative. If you really try and force yourself to prohibit them from ever, ever, ever realizing that they are there. Um, but in a sense, it's, in a sense, I guess I would agree. Yeah. Um, on, um, oh, sorry. Um, um just, just uh, saying, um, she doesn't say um, that uh, like nobody feels anything. That that's crazy. But um, there is uh, no um, universal uh, fear or love or happiness. Um, the individual. Um, interpretation of uh, the, the you know different uh, hormones and all the stuff that's going on uh, in the body um how to see it's, it's like i know the the perception of of color is a bit different different uh, between people but we still uh, say oh this is this is yellow and we agree that this is yellow. And I think it's similar and we say, oh, okay, this feeling is happiness. There is no physical, intrinsic 
a property that uh, would make uh, this yellow. This is just people trying to define stuff uh, in the world and uh, in themselves. Um, just, just a second, uh, uh, Gonzalo. Um, so, uh, years ago, I, I read an interview um, with a football player. I can't remember uh, his name. Uh, he used to have uh, panic attacks uh, before uh, every games, every game, um, and he thought uh, that this anxiety will, you know, cost uh, him uh, his career. Uh, and then, uh, then, he, then he thought, "Oh, maybe I'm not anxious. Maybe I'm excited for the game." And every time he uh, felt uh, you know, the heart rate uh, going up, sweating, um, he said to himself, uh, "I'm not anxious. I'm excited." It's the same bodily um, yeah, reaction or a f phenomenon, but just a switch in how uh, you perceive it uh, can change your attitude towards it. And I, I think it's, um, it's a very historic thing uh, to do. Yeah. Um. Yes, just to rephrase a little bit, something that helped me a lot about it. Um, it's it's mentioned in, on the video that that I've posted on the comments. Um, I'm dealing with this type of things since a long time ago, um, and the first time that I've heard this type of thing that it's it's not the hormone itself; it's the meaning that you attach to the hormone. Let's say what accounts for what happens with it. Um, so when I had <laughs> this um, psychologist, I think, um, yes, this psychologist explains that you, that in order to, you, that in order for, for, for the body to function properly, you need to help it, um, by switching the meanings of things. Um, and, and I think that that's the main principles um, concept related to, to, to that. To, to, um, in, in Stoicism, you try to reinterpret things, um, rephrase them in a way that you can find them helpful for what you want to do rationally. And sometimes you have these situations where um, let's say that one part overrides the other and you just need to go with it for a little while and try to do nothing and it will just go to its peak and then it will fade away i've learned a lot about emotions by playing around with children uh it's really amazing i mean if if you can bear uh playing with children it's really hard task to do um but um children switch emotions really fast. It's like they can go from, from a tantrum to uh, complete joy to uh, crying to setting something on fire. And it's, it's like a hurricane, right? Um, but, but they are switching it. It's, it's like they are, they are not stuck with one. It's, it's just like they're flowing somehow. Um, and, and I think that when we start to grow, that's kind of like what happens. You stuck with one. You say like, huh, I, 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 you start to judge that emotion in the sense of, I didn't like this. I don't want this to happen ever again. And so now you're stuck with one and you're preventing that to, you're kind of like holding it in order for, for it to never happen again or, or to happen more. I don't know. It depends. Um, and and in that mechanism of holding it, you're blocking it, and, and you're not kind of like you're creating this response automatically. You're you're used to the the idea that oh, I this in this situation I don't like to feel this way, so let's do everything to prevent it. Um, and in that extent, it goes to 
places where you don't really uh, have too much control other than just let it pass. Uh, for when I learned that in Buddhism, that for me was like, ah, okay, <laughs> I think I'm getting the hang of it. Um, I mean, how much, how much ability do we actually have to um, control emotion? I mean, I'm just thinking of that quote by Viktor Frankl: "Between the stimulus and the reaction, sorry, between the stimulus and the response, there's space." And we have the opportunity in that space to uh, control our perception of what the situation is. But I think that's something that we need to, certainly for, for myself, I need to train myself to do that. It's not a natural response for me. It's something that needs to be learned. And that's what I've been trying to work on is just that space where there is room for, for you to think about what reaction you will have is utilizing that split second in a positive way, um, in the right way. Yeah, so I think that we, we can sort of control our emotions to a certain degree. Um, and I think as sort of logical human beings, we actually have a responsibility to do that. that that's, that's my view. From a Buddhist perspective, I will say that you cannot control the emotion itself. You can control the meaning that you put to an emotion, mm -hmm. uh, you can you cannot control something that appears before you think it because emotions appear before the thought it's something really weird mm -hmm. um i think I, I i'm not really sure about this but i think that um let's say they have tried to study where emotions are coming from and they haven't found it yet it's like chemically they can understand what parts of the brain activate it, but that's it. It's it's like, and it happens in less than less less than 150 milliseconds. It's unbelievable um, how fast it happens. That's why the only action that you have is your your own reaction. It's like okay, it's there. I get, let's assume that it will be there. My conscious will never be that fast for for me at least. Um, yeah, actually, this is a good this is a good transition point because um, you're saying a little bit um, about what you're practicing over the week and something I wanted to mention that it um, just like what you're talking about from a Buddhist perspective in, in cognitive behavior therapy, they also say the same thing that um, you can't. It's really impossible to catch the emotion beforehand, like the stimulus to reaction time. It's kind of impossible to stop the reaction from happening. The, the best thing you can do is actually after the reaction happens, the, what you can control is how quickly and how often you can recognize that reaction when it happens. Because when you do recognize that reaction, um, then, then you can start to change it. Like then, then as Gonzalo said, you can, you can apply, you can attribute um, something meaningful to it that, that's good for you, beneficial, advantageous for you, um, and then it can help you grow. Uh, and also uh, um, turn that passion into um, uh, with turn that passion into something else with a rational outlook. Um, feel a little bit of um, uh, joy that you take and take this opportunity. And if that joy is only that you feel good that I I caught this passion that I I did that that I accomplished something that I don't have to feel this anymore. Um, uh, that's enough of a joy to feel. I mean, when you catch it, at least for me, it is because that would be an accomplishment already. Um, I'm also in the early stages of doing this from last week. Like this is um, something I just started thinking about really, truly that um, really catching it um, when it's there. It's also really difficult sometimes because I mean, the that list that we were mentioning before the um, by Dr. Jan Garrett, the, uh, that, that I mean, catching every single type of passion is impossible and keeping a catalog of that in your brain is impossible sometimes we may not even recognize the passion when it's there um so i guess my question is just to end it off um because i think this is a good transition and um something i wanted to ask um did anybody do this over the last week um the recommendation was that uh the end of our last meeting um to reflect on 
So actually, I'll bring it up and just read it off that um, catch yourself whenever you become overwhelmed by an emotion or some passionate or emotional reaction. Um, we ask that you reflect on your passion. It's just a judgment and opinion and nothing else external to you, which you can't control. Um, contemplate the, stage, the, the sage and, and meditate how the ideal, ideal stoic would uh, react. <clears throat> and um, and with a, a big note afterwards, reflect on why you're feeling that way, um, but not to overthink it, um, not to ruminate it, not to distress yourself over it. Um, just understand perhaps when we say reflect on the cause of it, reflect ref afterwards, you should also go back to point number one, reflect on the cause of it <clears throat> and then tell yourself, oh, then that they came from nothing. That's just a reaction that I, that, that doesn't have to happen all the time. Um, so how did you guys do? Um, did you, anybody practice this theme throughout the last week? And if so, were there any instances or experiences you had and um, if you want to share uh, how it worked or, or didn't work. Yeah, I had a couple of uh, opportunities. Um, and I think the, um, how to say, the most severe, the most powerful one um, is um this got a, a message that uh, my grandmother uh, uh, fell uh, in the street without any any other details just just fell and uh, i didn't i didn't know it's like just stumbled a stroke heart attack like uh, so i started uh, to to worry and uh, really you know this is your mind races and you think about everything that could could have uh, happened um so so i tried uh, i tried to, to ask myself all right what i know um what uh, can I ask and what can I do? Um, so I just uh, send messages um, and uh, call my father. Uh, he didn't know anything uh, yet as well. Um, so the only thing I, I could have done is is just wait. Um, and every time uh, during the, I think it was like an hour before, um, yeah, the family actually uh, got more details. Um, every time uh, I thought uh, I had this overwhelming feeling of uh, anxiety and worry, I said, "I've done what what I I, I can." The only thing I can do is wait. And it worked to, to my absolute surprise. I, I didn't feel as anxious and as worried uh, as I thought I, I would be. Um, yeah. She, she broke uh, her uh, arm, but everything else uh, seems to be all right. <clears throat> I think for me personally, I I wake up early every morning, maybe about five thirty six. Not that I want to, it's just it's what happens. And there's a space of maybe an hour and a half between me waking up and my son and my wife. And I use that time really badly. Really, what I should do is get up, get a shower, be productive. Instead, I just ruminate. Um, and just wait, wait for people to wait, to wake up. And so this morning, um, obviously that needs to change that. 
this morning I was just worried about a particular thing about my business, um, which has been a worry quite consistently over the past, I'd say, 12 months. But instead of worrying about it this time, I used past experience of other things that I've worried about and remembered what the outcomes were, um, which were positive outcomes. So I didn't really actually drill down into what the actual worry was. I just thought, well, I've been in this situation before where I've worried and there was absolutely no reason for me to worry at all. So I just won't. And that seemed to work. And what I liked about that approach was, and I think why it worked, it was just completely logical. You know, there was no gray areas in that one. This has happened before. So probability is this will happen again. Yeah. So I don't know whether that's stoic or not, probably not. Um, oh, it is? Okay, good. Um, but it's quite a simple method um, and one that I intend to use more. Uh, I actually think that in cognitive uh, behavioral theory, it's called thinking that you are enough. That's something mm -hmm. that you need to remember. In uh, At least that's what my therapist is constantly telling me. It's okay. like, instead of, instead of worrying about what will happen, think that you will be enough to, to resolve the problem. Right, yeah. Yeah. But that's also really helpful when you don't have that many success stories. Uh, I usually have a lot of failure stories. Um, so that means that um, sometimes my brain plays that sort of tricks where it says you have failed forever now and you will not be able to solve it. And I, I kind of like have to constantly remember that the past is the past. I have grown in many ways. Um, I will be able to be enough for this. And if I'm not, um, I will be able to ask for help whenever I need it. I think that those two things have changed a lot in me. Um, in order to follow that, uh, I, I usually deal a lot with uh, frustration. Um, sometimes I feel like I cannot communicate uh, properly and people usually don't understand what I'm saying. And I have to um, sometimes, not always, I have like this um, really bad anger about it. It's like it, um, it ha I have this burst of what is it so difficult that I'm saying that it's difficult to understand? What, where's the complexity of it? Um, and it's, it's getting better. Um, the um, the only way that I, I could kind of like understand how to deal with it, it's like, um, okay, let's. This person is not understanding. What's wrong with it? What's wrong with another person asking you again something if they are not understanding? Um, and and that thing alone has at least. Um, reduce this um, anxiety of, of kind of like of, of this, I'm a volcano and I will burst in any minute <laughs> uh, sort of thing. Um, th that helps to the volcano not to burst. Sometimes I have more difficulties um, because when I feel that I've made already the effort, um, sometimes it's, it's difficult to fight with it when you are constantly trying and you're frustrated with not being able to communicate, but um, it's, I mean, for me, it's practice. I have to practice every day, um, not to roll my eyes sometimes with a question. Uh, I think that that's the, the, the worst part of me. Um, and it's it's getting better talking, talking and laughing about it too. It's like, oh, there's the dramatic me now rolling the eyes and usually expressing that to the other and it's like okay let me do something and i kind of like go away a little bit i roll my eyes i do my tantrum and then i go back and it's like okay let's um let's start from the beginning now so it's like some sort of release of some pressure internal pressure somehow uh, that's what usually works good 
We have Latin blood, Gonzalo. You can't deny I, it. I fight it a lot. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah. yeah. So it seems the key element is to just uh, oh hello Abdul, uh, is to just uh, give yourself time to feel, and then start thinking, and then I act. So instead of feeling and immediately acting just uh, put a space between them. I actually it. did the, the opposite thing for too long. Uh, at, and at the beginning, when I was really young, I, I kind of like, I was told not to do it. It's like, um, you shouldn't feel that way. Just, uh, why are you feeling that way? Your feelings are rational. It's like they're not connected to whatever it's happening. Uh, so I tried to block them a, a long time, and that created a lot of other problems. And now I'm just applying that kind of like, let it fill out. And as it's filling out, it will fill you up, and then it will go down. It will just go away. Just let it come past you. That's, uh, I think that's the Buddhism approach to it. Um, just try to not set anything on fire or anything <laughs> and just um, let it happen, it, let it observe it, and that's it. Yeah. Um, oh. right, go ahead. Um, I, was, I was thinking of some experiences this past week with, um, yeah, I guess it's, it's hard to define because I'm thinking, is it, is it frustration, anxiety, or anger? And because sometimes, um, Sometimes I think I'm so angry, but I don't know if that's anger necessarily or frustration. Sometimes frustration, that those are the two, I think, emotions for me that are difficult to distinguish because sometimes it's too low level anger and I'm not really sure if I'm just being frustrated or annoyed by something. I, 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 so anyway, I mean, I guess the definition is, an, is another another topic entirely, but um, I have, uh, I, I, constantly am in, in communication with my with my boss, the, the headmaster of the school where I teach, um, because I'm um, the coordinator for our international foreign pro, foreign program, which is in English. Uh, so we're constantly talking to each other. And like anybody can understand uh, when you talk to your boss that often, sometimes what they're going to say or do or ask you to do or decide is going to take you off. That's just very normal. That's just what happens in every job. Um, and uh, for me, there's one thing that you guys have said that doesn't work for me. If I say to myself, and I guess this is just contextual for me, it's just based on context. For me, if I say this will all be over soon, I, I can't say that because I know the next day is gonna come and I'm gonna talk to her again. So I can't, in the long run, in the long run, I can never make the argument to myself um, I shouldn't be angry because we're, we're going to get through this because I'm always going to, in the, in the end, if I say that to myself, I'm, I'm lying to myself that I won't maybe ever feel this way again with her. So what, what works for me is, um, uh, what works for me is if she, if she says something or decides something that I think is a wrong decision, some sometimes ethically wrong because these are these are kids we're talking about so if there's pressure she wants to put on them or there's some decision about the environment of the school she wants to make um that that unnerves me then i i i take a breath through my through my nose and um, i first take a breath and i under I, I try and put myself in her position i i think contemplating in the sage um i realize only works for me when I'm not in the same room. If I leave the room and I contemplate individually what I what I think should happen, what I think I should do, and how I think I should act and feel, that works for me because I'm I'm separated from everybody else and I have time to think of the ideal person and how they would act. But if I'm in the same room, what works for me is putting myself in their shoes, and I kind of understand that I, I may not know necessarily all the information they know because they they're hierarchically above me and what helps for me is a, is a, is a motion. I, I nod my head because I need to signal to myself that this is okay and that what her decision is 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 okay. Like 
I can deal with this. I can do this. That, the nodding the head really helps me. Um, and I think if I, um, when I do that, I leave the room, I'm feeling a lot better because um, I'm no longer feeling the emotion anymore. All I'm feeling is I have a task to do and I'm motivated to finish that task. Um, it, this doesn't really sound like I'm placing, um, um, I'm switching my emotions or switching gears, but what I am doing, I try and place meaning on it. I try and tell myself that um, this decision is making some sort of change and I need to execute this change. And this is some job I need to fulfill. And if I fulfill this job, I'm gonna feel a lot better about it. I don't have to think about it anymore. Um, and I guess you can make the same argument that there's always gonna be another decision or job I need to do that I can, that will frustrate me. But um, uh, I think it works a lot better when I I think about the future, I think about the current job being over, then I think about the um, the current conversation with my boss being over. Because I, if I try and contemplate the future, you know, this will all be over soon. Um, if it's to do with a person, then I know it's not going to work because I'm seeing that person, that person will act the same way. But if it, if I, if I, um, instead of thinking about my frustration in terms of the person, and instead of thinking, think about my frustration in terms of the task or the decision being made, then I can be a lot more rational about it because I know that that decision is no longer um, attributed to a person. There's a distinction between I can make between the person and the decision. Um, and I think I haven't wrapped myself around it yet. I'm still finding it difficult. I really am still finding it difficult because for me, it just doesn't work. I have a very strong um, inherently, and I, I don't know, and I think you're right, Gonzalo, this may have been years in the making, but I have a very strong moral compass. I am not trying to say that I am morally superior. When I say moral compass, I mean, I just have a very natural instinct to get upset over something I feel is morally corrupt. Or I, I don't want to make it sound outrageous. He's not making outrageous decisions, but you know the feeling. And I think um, I haven't exactly wrapped my head around how to deal with it. Because when you when you feel like something is morally wrong, like there's a, there's a wrong decision being made, and you bring it up to the level of morally wrong, it's harder to get away from it. Because, oh, it's morally wrong. I have to do something about this. Um, and you don't want to feel any other way anymore because it's something morally wrong you have to fix. Um, I think perhaps it's it's difficult. I think I, what I have to do is more independent evaluation outside of those six situations because what I have to do is convince myself that there are some decisions that are amoral, not uh, immoral or moral, just amoral. They're just decisions being made. She's the boss and she's just doing her thing. And I can't be so upset about it as to think this is some moral uh, crusade I should I should feel frustrated about this. So um, I think in the future, I think I have to do more independent exercises for me, contemplating the sage and um, kind of reflecting on my perspective on that particular um particular emotion. This is not a moral decision that she's making, or this is not immoral in any other in any other situation. This is not something morally upset I have to get upset about. And so I think that could work. But I have to start, I think, after the last week, I see you, Tony, um, I have to kind of re, um, uh, reorient myself to do more reflection independently of that. Uh, Tony, go ahead. I think the, the twisted part of my brain is thinking, it's difficult to exercise, uh, sorry, to execute change. Would it be easier just to execute her? Would that sort of, <laughs> obviously that's not possible. Um, that's the twisted aspect of my brain. But really the, the interesting thing about what you said is the ethical side of things. I mean, do you really sort of put those ethical quandaries on your own shoulders that you may present to you? And is that part of the issue? Um, do you, are you asking, sorry, Gonzalo, um, I'll come back to you in a second. So I guess what you're asking is um, not uh, not the, not the, um, the evaluation of the decision or, or something she says herself. I guess mm -hmm. you can apply this to any situation when I have a discussion with somebody. But you're asking, um, 
am I placing the burden of solving the situation on my own shoulders? And well, the, ethical, that, the, the ethical element of, of, the, of the situation. You said that she presents ethical issues to you um, because yeah. these are children that you're dealing with. You know, do you feel responsible for the, for the ethical elements of those, even though it's not your decision? I think I think that could be it. I think to some I think to some extent, and I have to do some hard um, evaluation of my role in the school um, and how responsible I am. But I think you're right. I think I do feel a responsibility, or in Franco's terms, responsibleness for um, uh, if there's an ethical decision being made about the that the students I don't like then I should do something about it, or I should protect them in some way. Um, because these are students, these are children. And uh, if it's something ethical, um, then I need to, I, I, I do feel responsible because I'm, I'm a teacher. Um, it's different in, a, in another company, you have a hierarchy, but in a school, it doesn't work like that. Everybody's pretty much on the same level, teachers. And then a headmaster. That's it. There's, there's, a, it's a completely different structure. So I think in a school, I feel a little bit more responsible for what for what goes on than, than in another institution. Um, um Gonzalo. Um, I, to, to be honest, I have dealt in the past with similar situation. Not to compare software engineering to uh, teaching children, uh, but sometimes what I've noticed is that. Um, someone in a higher position of me um, decides a design, for example, for something, and it, it doesn't feel right. And the at, at the beginning, I wasn't um, really sure about what type of feeling was it? Am I angry about this because of what? Um, but then I understood that the problem was that I was seeing things as I being the right one or the righteous, let's say. Um, and there are a lot of point of views about, let's say, what will be the consequences of things. Um, when I process it, process it at that part, for me, it was a little bit clearer that let's say I was using some of my judgments in order to um, I was using some other thing in order to say I don't really like that is that yeah I, I can draw I just have a I, I'll respond to you because I think I am getting getting something from this that will help Abdul, do you have three screens right now? Am I seeing three screens for, for you? I don't know what's happening there. I, I I left the room and rejoined. For some reason, there are three of us, three of me now. So I for I'm a not second sure which there, me is talking. Well, yeah, for a second there, I thought so, you were uh, you were going to start speaking, and all three of your screens were going to start speaking <laughs> at the same time. Um. But uh, I wanted to come back to Gonzalo. I think I think I have maybe a possible yeah. a possible solution. Um, that uh, I think what you guys said about taking a minute to uh, in the situation when you're feeling that passion, taking some time to um, l let it kind of dissolve um, and then take prudent action. Um, I think I need to go further in time, so to speak. So. Uh, like that example in the uh, software development company, or in my example, when a boss makes a decision, um, I think what I could do is I could say, listen, I don't know if I'm right or wrong. Like, I think I'm right. But to be honest, maybe she has the right idea. Maybe I need to under, maybe I need to see this decision through. And then on the other side of it, when I see the consequences, I say to myself, okay, so was that right or wrong? So maybe I need to, I need to also wait but I need to wait further. I need to not just wait through the, 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 the passion. I need to wait through the decision-making and the action and then see, um, and then see the outcome. I think that will help also is to kind of, like you said, to kind of understand that I, I need to accept that. Like I can't deny that I don't feel that I'm right, but I need to accept that 
I may think I'm right now, but I don't know if I'm going to feel like I'm right after the decision's made. And I say, that wasn't so bad. That actually, actually what, what happened was um, a wise decision or a prudent decision and no, no consequence came out of that that I should feel um, morally unjust about. So I think, I think you're right. I think what I got from what you said really helped because I think I should wait a little bit longer sometimes I, um, and see through the consequences in the action um, as, you know, this doesn't apply to every situation, but I think to most situations, this can, this can apply. And, and then on the other side of it. Um, uh, also see to, to add something else, um, I got to this because um, I think it was my first um, therapist that I see, that I saw. She told me something like, um, "Sometimes there are trains of thoughts that have a lot of uh, wagons in between, and because you are in this automatic place, um, you are kind of like jumping through a conclusion from the starting point to the end." without really realizing if that connection is rational or irrational. So, um, I don't know, sometimes that is useful, right? It's like, that's an oven, it could be hot or cold, good. Um, and usually you protect yourself in saying, ovens are always hot, so I will not touch it. Uh, and let's say, and that's your autopilot, uh, but sometimes, there are like these really small things. Uh, in my case, it was um, overcomplication leads to failure. And every time that I perceived something as really complicated, I was like, no, this is wrong. And it was instantaneous for me. And it triggered a lot of other things together like that. When I started to notice that the, the train started with complicated equals bad, and the judgment was was just like that, complicated equal bad. Uh, when I started to to envision that, let's say, I I could uh, create spaces in the wagons. Let's say instead of just complicated equals bad, I was like, huh, maybe some complicated things are bad. Maybe I need to create a uh, kind of like more um, details about why some complicated things are bad, but not all of the complicated things are bad. And when I started to kind of like, um, let's say, um, split that that equal sign inside my brain, I could deal with this thing better. But I, I needed to create the space in between the things. Uh, and usually for me, it was helpful to, to write it down about the thoughts that I had, kind of like a free, um, I don't know how it's called in English. Um, when you kind of like think um, and write. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, free association or something. Um, free writing or freestyle or, um, uh, uh, I know what you mean though, just write without thinking about what you're writing, just write down your thoughts right then and there, yeah. Exactly, uh, and then I was like, okay, Let's go take a break. Let's go back and read what we what we um, write. And I was like, oh, wow, <laughs> this is OK. This doesn't make sense here. Here, there's something that doesn't add up completely. And it, that thing alone was really helpful for me to, to try to understand how the wagons are connected inside my brain. <laughs> Um, I think this really fits nicely into stoicism because what I'm doing is, well, I think from a meta from a not a metaphysical, but from a yeah from a metaphysical understanding of the brain, that um, that these emotions are really part of the cognitive structure. I mean, what I'm basically doing is I'm basically and um, I mean, who knows? Maybe what I'm feeling is justified, but I don't know that yet. I think what my brain is habitually doing is confounding, like mixing up the rational part and the emotional part. And I can't tell the difference. And so whenever it's like an association, like you said, it's it's like I am, my brain has, I guess, through a bunch of experiences in the past, mixed up some emotions with some 
some perception is about how I see other people act or do things. And so whenever I see other people act or do things in a certain way, all of a sudden it triggers me emotionally. And then all of a sudden my moral compass gets triggered. It's a whole chain reaction. And I think what I'm doing is I'm mixing up all these things um, and I can't, I need to understand that there's a difference. Like basically what I'm doing is mixing up the events for what they are with the judgments. I'm mixing up the, um, 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 I'm, I'm basically getting to that level initially of comprehension, the, um, of uh, attesting to the idea that what I'm feeling is true and acknowledge and, and representative of what's happening. Like you said, the, um, the three stages, it's a physical reaction, a judgment, then a, then a comprehension. And I guess my brain just goes through all of those because it's associating the emotion with, with, a, with an event. And also mm. because it's using the tools that it has from, from evolution, right? It's uh, all the things that you just mentioned are intuition. Kind of like Actually, it's an unrationalized uh, solution to a problem that you have no idea why you are solving it like that. It's just, I don't know, it's the way that we do things here. When I'm, um, think about it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it just hit me that um, we met, we haven't mentioned this book since like very early on, um, maybe months ago, but um, this book I'm still in the midst of reading. Uh, it's you know, pretty famous now by a couple of statisticians and psychologists. Um, and you're right, it's like, it's, it's actually evolutionary advantageous to some extent that we have some things that are automatic because otherwise we wouldn't be able to act in life like i think they, they use ex examples like opening a door handle like you don't want to think about doing that you just do it because it makes sense and it that helps our routine in life but um i think sometimes we overdo it sometimes we end up um uh just making everything habitual and Stoicism asks us to say, no, no, we, we don't want everything habitual um, because sometimes we have to, at least maybe maybe we do, maybe we want to organize and say, listen, um, what we're doing habitually is associating emotions with rational action that shouldn't be. We're letting passions, uh, we're, we're, we're attesting to our passions that shouldn't be and very quickly and automatically. And what we should be doing automatically instead is automatically catching our reactions and automatically going through these through these cognitive strategies to reinterpret and make more meaningful r rational action afterwards i think um it's not wrong to have some any any processes that we have in life automatic but i think what we should this whole idea of um how to practice you know getting you getting rid of our passions is a um um, that should be the thing that's automatic, not not our thinking through, not not our passions that come out of nowhere. Um, yeah, thank you everybody for sharing your stories as well. Um, this this really helped me think. Um, and um, I, I wanted to go through some of the more like some of the other light fragen. I think um, we can come back to um, Gonzalez's when he comes back. Um, but I think maybe we get to a, we're coming to a point where we can start answering the question: um, How do we know what we're feeling is either a rational emotion or a true passion? How do we know what we're feeling is, for example? um frustration or as the author put it in one in in that in that book that was cited in the article prudent caution um how do we how do we make that distinction um and i guess what i'm asking is how does it feel like i think we know a good a good light fraga for now is how do we know what it feels like um uh can we think about this if we know what frustration and anger feels like um, what does prudent caution feel like? Because it's still a feeling, it's still an emotion to it to an extent. Um, but um, is there something different about feeling that way than feeling um, 
um, a passion, something as strong as frustration, anger, malice, or, or any of the others. I think just to start it off, I mean, I think, I, I'm not sure if this is the same for every feeling or emotion, but one of the a short summary of what they say is that um, these uh, three responsive states, um, they all should come with some sort of feeling and control, like, like uh, the way you could distinguish between the passions and um, uh, joy, rational wish and prudent caution, these kind of sage-like qualities that you should be feeling um, instead of the passions. Um, that passions uh, already described are different because when you when you don't feel a passion, when you feel like, um, uh, when you feel this joy, rational wish or prudent caution, you're feeling in control. You don't feel like this surge of passion coming up. You feel like you have a handle on it. You feel like, like you, you can, you can, you can think through things more clearly and it's not an automatic process anymore. It's something you can plan and execute rather than um, rather than just irrationally going through the motions. I think something that I find useful just generally um, is just trying to keep a calm disposition in all of these various circumstances in which we find ourselves and that tends to buy you some time um you know obviously there's an internal reaction straight away which you're saying is the emotion but i think the space is between that and the external reaction which is how you'll respond um and just staying calm you know it, it sounds like such a simple thing but it has such a dramatic effect certainly for me um, when you're dealing with emotional situations and it buys you that extra little bit of time to make a logical external response. I think it's, um, I think it's contagious too, that, um, it's a good tip when you feel, when you, when you pur purposefully feel calm, uh, it, um, and somebody else, uh, or their, um, there's two sides about it. If you're, if you have a, um, like if you're in a personal exchange with somebody else, they'll start to feel calm. Um, and also if it's, if it's some sort of other external event without anybody else there, I think feeling calm automatically makes you reinterpret the situation, makes you understand it differently. Um, also, as another tip, um, your your brain, this is a lot of things that I've read, uh, your brain kind of like has the, the emotion interpretation first of what you're saying. It's like it, it happens backward of what you're thinking. It's like if that's interesting for my brain or it's triggering emotions, I will that will happen first, and then I will understand what the other person is saying. So uh, for me, that was like, oh, okay, that explains a lot about what, happened, what, what things are happening to me and how should I um, deal with things. It's like, okay, first let, let's let the emotion pass, and then let's try to see if I understand correctly what the other person is saying. Um, and and that space, I think that it's what's doing the the thing that you were mentioning, uh, Tony. That um, okay, let's see what let let's see how we deal with this thing. I think that's um, I think that 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 leads us to I guess I guess a certain conclusion, maybe not a conclusion, but a um. An observation that I think a big way we can tell the difference between like a passion and one of these um, preferred um, preferred uh, in preferred emotions, preferred rational emotions like joy, rational wish, and prudent caution. That I think the difference is that with a passion, um, uh, we never we never end up taking the time to retroactively reflect on it and change it. But with um, with any of these rational emotions. 
um, uh, we end up um, we end up taking the time to stay calm. Like I think in any situation, most of us um, uh, most of us, at least without training, feel a surge of passion or emotion, and then right before you stay calm, right, right before you get calm. Um, you have to think about it a little bit. I think that's how you can tell, like, it's going to be a rational emotion. Like, once you feel calm, that calmness is a rational emotion. Um, it's kind of, I, I guess I would call it a joy in their their model of 3D rational emotions. Um, that uh, you know it's rational, not a passion, because it's something you had to control. It's something you had to actually actively make sure you do. I think you're right as well, Steve, that, you know, if, sorry, Abdul. Um, I think if, if uh, cheers, thank you. So if we react in a certain way, you know, the psychology of people being what it is, they will mirror whether they consciously or subconsciously understand that. You know, for, so for instance, yesterday, um, there's an incident where my son started to choke on a sandwich um, and being not medically trained um it was quite a a, a, a difficult experience and it would have been easy for me to blame my wife at that point because she was you know looking after him so but i decided to just be calm she was calm and then he was calm and stopped choking so <laughs> you know it, it, it how we react i think we can't underestimate the effect that that has on other people around us in that same situation at that same time. So being calm for me is something that I've learned and utilize on a daily basis. Yeah. That's a really good word to use. They're, they're, um, Abdul, <laughs> um, they're, um, uh, they're learned. That's a really good word. I just wanted to point out that emotions are learned. They're not, um, they're not even as Gonzalo was pointing out. They're not like the children has to have to learn how to use their emotions. That's why they go through all of them all, at the same time. Sometimes they flip through them. They have to learn how to use them, and they have to learn which ones are best to use. Abdul. Yeah. Thanks. Um, yeah, I, I can relate to Tony's um, story actually. By um, me in the past, like I, I I signed up for first aid course and one of the reasons was that um i remember back then I, i've been asked why why are you joining this course um and my basic answer to that is i, I really do enjoy helping others and i do want i do want to help others and uh, um saving people's lives in in uncertain times like if you see someone lying on the floor and how to react to that instead of freaking out and calling ambulance, then at least you have something to do really. Um, so it's essential to learn first aid. Secondly is I, I really enjoy, so passionate <laughs> about helping others. Um, and thirdly, I was thinking of raising my confidence. I do feel more confident. And um, my colleague just saying confidence, how, how how, what's the relationship between confidence and first aid, he said. And I, and I just basically told him, imagine that someone is choking in a restaurant. Uh, one of your friends or one of your family members, like how would they react compared to you? So at least you will act rationally any better. You should calm yourself and try to tackle it by whatever you have, calling triple nine or emergency services and while they're approaching you, hearing uh, some instructions and following some instructions because you already have some basics. And yeah, I do think that um, uh, gaining knowledge in certain areas uh, brings confidence and calm. Uh, calming yourself is a key uh, I can relate also to Stephen's, uh, uh, sorry, Steve, Steve, <laughs> Stephen, I've got all his friends called Stephen, sorry. Right. Yeah, Steve, um, uh, when he said, like, noding <laughs> is helping, really getting through 
whatever your boss is saying. And I do agree. I've noticed that uh, when we are in uh, group meetings and the uh, team leader instruct or supervisor instructing things that I'm not really convinced about or I'm not aligned with my supervisor's priorities, I do feel that noting helps <laughs> helps getting through the meeting at least. Maybe not really getting you convinced on what's been said, but um, yeah, I, I think it does it does help uh, <laughs> somehow getting through this hard moments. But it's mainly, uh, lastly, I would say is um, uh, when I get the feeling of. Um, when I feel annoyed or angry, I don't take any decisions because I feel that decisions taken uh, in the moment of sadness or anger may be regretted later. And I do try to calm myself. But the first question I ask myself if I'm angry or annoyed, uh, I say, am I hungry? Have I eaten something? <laughs> or am I starving <laughs> and was busy throughout the day? Because... Hang hunger really makes you angry. Uh, I've noticed that. <laughs> I can tell that from experience. Secondly, I do ask myself, sometimes I'm not hungry, but did I have too much caffeine today? And I do ask myself this. And again, yes, I have five cups of coffee. And maybe that's why I'm quite annoyed. Maybe I need to drink some water to reduce the intensity and not really go with this feeling any further. Third question is that, am I really angry because of the statement made, regardless whether it's true or not? I mean, because sometimes you get annoyed by maybe you hearing from your boss that saying uh, or making judgment or assumptions about you, but then reflecting back, you're asking them, uh, could I clarify why you think this way, why you have this bad judgment or bad feeling about me? And then when they return back to you with no evidence, there's no concrete evidence on that. So why you should be annoyed about it in the first place? Because it's not true. So you're, you're annoyed about, about things that are fiction, <laughs> really. Like, like yeah. Um, and I do say that, like, at once I was sitting down and all of a sudden, I've received a message from a team leader of a project I'm working on. And he just said, please, like, um, we have created the cloud file where we share our findings or task, completed task. And basically, uh, he said, please, sorry, please remove the file from the cloud. It should be approved before it's been uploaded. I said, OK. But then he said, okay, you're quite jumping and you don't follow instructions and that will reduce your evaluation. And I was saying, right, let me pause here. Since when did you say, gain my approval before you upload my files? You didn't provide these guidelines. I mean, I was, my reaction was, you, you really <laughs> giving me the blame. I, I, I will not take the blame for guidelines that didn't exist in the first place. In fact, his instruction were completely the opposite to that because I asked, can we create a cloud file for my task? I said, yes, you can. And feel free to drop everything there, everything and anything. <laughs> so, um, yeah, th there's no reason for getting annoyed about such things. And, uh, yeah, if, the, if, if whatever has been said against you is not true, then I will not get annoyed about it. But I'll be concerned for one reason. Because if you're working with people that don't trust you or have certain beliefs about you, then that means um, it's not a healthy environment to work in. And you need to get this right by having serious conversation. But yeah, sorry, I, I think I went off quite a bit there, but I'll keep it there for now. I think you're all good. You, uh, I think this is your first time really speaking in this uh, in this meeting, so no worries. 
Um, just to summarize, I really liked your points, just a quick summary that I think a good theme to pull from what you were talking about is that um, don't worry about what other people think or say. I mean, to an extent, sometimes you have to listen to other people and sometimes you have to reflect, wait, am I, am I doing this wrong? Do they have a point? And it's all, I think it's always good to do that. But I think past that point, if you decide, if you decide, wait, they're, you know, they, they don't really have a point. I think the, the response is not, like you said, the response is not um, to fire back at them. The response is to say, wait, there's nothing to be afraid of. You know, they, they have nothing. What they're saying is not true or mm, maybe um, out, of, out of whack um, and out of proportion. And I have nothing to be afraid of. And um, I think why I also said the, the conclusion I got from you was uh, not something explicitly you said, but a conclusion I think I can make is that don't worry about what other people think. I think sometimes we we also like to voice our concerns a little bit too loudly. Like we, 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 we go off the rail sometimes because we want to be seen and heard, but sometimes being seen and heard doing something, I guess you can call it heroic though, instinctually. I think this is an evolutionary thing. Like we, we try and we try and put ourselves out there, but I think you should say to yourself, there's nothing to be afraid of. And what is the point of, of, you know, going off the rails right now when it, it, there, there's, there's nothing hurting me, and if you go off the rail, you're just going to look like the person that is also um, doing exactly what they're doing. Um, I'm not sure if anybody else had had another uh, anything else to say about about that um, stream of thought, but I um, think we've we've covered most of the prompts except one. And uh, Gonzalo, I wanted to turn to you and uh, ask if you, <laughs> um, you already explained it and you, you, you explained it well. I think, I think you cleared up a lot of it. Um, but um, if I can just summarize, I guess the, the light fraga that you asked is, um, does, changing, I guess, removing, adding, or um, uh, replacing one of the components of the passions being, you know, this, this physical response, this first impression or judgment, and this, and then this final comprehension or attesting the, the, conf the affirmation that this passion is here, um, uh, is, is changing any one of those components enough to remove a passion? I think that's what you're asking, right? Yes, I, I want to correct myself because I said remove, but what I meant, it's kind of like a way of dealing with it. Removing in the sense that I was seeing them um, as obstacles in, in, in one's rationality, let's say, um, but kind of like dealing with it in a way that it's, um, I would say wise, but I don't know. For me, why sometimes it has too much judgment on it? It's 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 like when you say something it's good or bad. For me, it's, I never know. Um, so I guess I'll open it up to the floor. No, thank you. Um, uh, does does removing just one of those help? So um, again, uh, the 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 fist, the process that Nussbaum in her book in the in the book review um, describes is that when you feel a passion, you first get this physical response from from being stimulated. Then you get um, then you get this first impression or instinctual judgment, and then you get um, th then you're um, then you start becoming um, then you start recognizing the passion itself then you start, uh, and when I say that, I think it's not the kind of CBT therapeutic approach of, you know, acknowledging it's there and acknowledging it's present so you can get rid of it. No, this, this kind of comprehension they're talking about is your mind's accepting that this is a passion and let's go through with it. Um, by removing any one of those, um, a phys that, that physical response or the first impression um, or the comprehension is any just if we remove just one of those, is that enough to solve the passion problem? To to um, um, 
to help us through that passion and past that passion sufficiently. I think we already answered part of it though. I think we I think we answered the physical part at least. I think we answered the whole part about the physical sensation because I think we got past the point that we can't stop the physical response from happening. Um, so I think that's that physical response is partly impossible just from our biological makeup. There's an extent to which we're gonna have some sort of response. Um, I, I, and I guess just to start off with it, with an answer is that I think I think there it, it would be enough perhaps to stop with that judgment. I think for me, I would prefer to um, I, I I need to catch the judgment first. I need to catch the first impression. Um, um, I think there's a point to which you don't have to wait until after the passion comes. You need to um, uh, you need to stop yourself after that first judgment or an impression. Um, and I think you can practice that. I think you can practice, um, uh, like we were talking about, uh, reinterpreting or placing meaning on what we're doing in order to replace the judgment with um, a new judgment, so to speak, a new belief. I think for me personally, it's about recognizing what's rational and irrational in that time that you're talking about. You know, what is a rational response to this situation instead of just you know, leading off with your emotion? And that's such a difficult thing to master. I mean, I've, I haven't mastered it. So I don't know anyone that has. Um, but I think that's where the it's almost a responsibility as a parent myself it's, i feel it's my responsibility to really consider what's a rational approach to, to any situation that i'm presented with now um particularly when it's involving you know my, my child or whatever so it's it's more for me about that consideration is it rational irrational that happens to me very very quickly now maybe in a few seconds and the response will be you know, justifiably so. But I think it is personal responsibility. We have to take responsibility for how we act. And that's just a part of that process, is considering whether it's a right and proper way to, to react or whether it's not. Um, and but I, I do feel a real sense of responsibility about that now, whereas previously I didn't. Hi, Eva. Um, good Hello. to see you here. Um, yeah, I think I missed the most interesting part, but the good thing is I can rewatch it later on YouTube. <laughs> yes. um, and I like what you said that this distinction between rational and irrational, you have to, um, that's a really good tip because that's the whole, I guess that's what you're trying to fix is make it rational and not irrational. So once you start recognizing that what you're thinking or feeling or doing is irrational, then you can say, wait, 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 even if this is a, maybe a correct or, or, or good way to act and think, I first have to at least make this a rational decision um, because then, you're, then you know, then you feel you're in control. It's that um, feeling of um, uh, um, joy uh, this this rational joy um, that you 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 feel a sense of control over the action, even if it was correct in the first place, you at least have control over it. Yeah, one of the reasons why I don't really like the the, the rationality aspect of it, it's that it's really depending on the on the one making that choice, what is rational and what's not, um, and. For me, sometimes that thing is hard. Um, I, I'm not saying that it's rational to, let's say, deal with um, the frustration of your programming uh, by hitting the laptop or destroying it. I'm, I'm not saying that, uh, but I'm saying kind of like that in some situations, um, for example, yelling doesn't solve anything. Um, 
but it, it seems rational. It's like, what are the other ways of showing in a really quick way what's your emotional state, let's say? And th that's this sort of complicated things that um, I'm, I'm talking about. Also, I'm not saying that yelling is correct, right? It, I'm, I'm saying that, um, I don't know, sometimes you kind of like in, in those split seconds, you, you have kind of like, it's quicker to do it this way. I will ask for sorry later. And sometimes that's a rational decision, but it's, for me, sometimes that's not enough. Yeah, just to quickly bounce off that, I think rational is a um, vague word used by um, the early philosophers. Um, I think even all the way up through the 18th and 19th centuries, and, and then after that, it had been more critically dealt with. But I think rationality was always vague. And But today, I wouldn't consider it a necessarily good thing. I think you're right. I think um rationality like belief is kind of in the eyes of the beholder because rationality i think at least at base for me means you thought it through it was something planned and intent intended so in, in, intent to me is kind of a necessary um not maybe not sufficient but necessary condition for rationality it was with intent and conscious intent um but you could do anything with that right you can intent to Kill exactly. somebody you intend Mass to murderers for me they have the rationality to, to kill everyone and and that's mm -hmm. kind of like they make it makes sense for them to do it um i again i'm not saying that that's co some sort of correct i don't believe my my core belief is is that you you're not supposed to harm other people um but but kind of like it open up it opens this really creepy door where um then okay so in some way psychopath and um how do you say um serial killers they are doing what they believe that it's correct i've i've heard some uh serial killers saying that i felt the need to purge them from this world and it's like creepy in some way that in some extent, without the, the, the harming other people, I could be do it, doing the exact same thing. Kind of like, this is the correct way for me to solve something, but that's not maybe the whole picture of it because I'm missing some information. Right, but that's... Um like acting uh, on one virtue without uh, considering uh, the rest. Uh, if you act only on courage without uh, temperance uh, and wisdom, then it's basically just a stu stupidity. And if they felt they are acting reasonably, um, and did something like mass murder, uh, we can assume their ruling faculty, as uh, uh, Marcus Rose uh, puts it, is not in line with the rest of humanity and with the universe. And you need the wisdom and you need the reflection uh, acting um, just by um, your first uh, thoughts or your first understanding is maybe following your internal reason, but um, is not <laughs> reasonable. <laughs> um, no, I really like that, yeah. th this idea about all of them having to play together nicely, let's say, all of this... Um, values that we are following pillars let's say uh, they they should play all together i think that that solves a lot of that idea um 
especially in regards what what this majority thing brings also to the game. Uh, sometimes uh, the majority of people are doing something that it's wrong, and you know, and everybody knows that it's wrong, but they are doing it anyway. And that I think that's not, yeah, sufficient. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think. Um, yep. Uh, just, just to point out with the virtues, the one virtue that's I I see even online and in our in our discussions, but everywhere, the one that the one that I see less often mentioned is just is justice, and I think that's where this comes into play. I think uh, even if you act wise, sometimes you're not necessarily acting wise without being just as well, and I think that justice component might help solve um how how to act ethically not just wisely temperately and courageously it's to act ethically so that mass murderer is obvious may, may actually be acting wisely from his past experiences definitely courageously in a sense but definitely not justly and i think that just part the ethical part um because i think and i say ethics in a modern sense i think for the stoics they thought of ethics as a holistic thing for all these four, with, with all these four virtues. Um, but in the modern sense, I think we would more or less equate eth an ethical or moral sensibility with the virtue of just justice. And I think that's where that comes into play that um, you need to also, you know, contemplate if your rational action is in line with each of the virtues, but I just I highlighted just because justice because I realized it, it's one of the virtues that less often discussed, but maybe this is where it kind of comes into play. Yes, but the, for for me, justice somehow has the same problem that rationality. Somebody else needs to tell this is the this is the right thing. I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, I've been in another philosophy group and they kind of like, they explained that justice needs to be imparted by somebody else. That it needs to be in a in, in some situations, somebody else who is bringing this up. This, this is more like a philosophical sometimes um, conversation, not really from the perspective of stoicism, but because I felt like they were using the word justice in a completely different way. Um, more, more in the sense of, um, I forgot the word, sorry. Um, it, if more, more in the sense of the right amount of something, uh, rather than, um, kind of like this, um, right of wrong perspective of the word justice that it that it involves let's say in today's society um but th that's kind of like i have a lot of problem with words <laughs> um yeah you have a good tony yeah, I just I think it's it's a really interesting discussion. I think it's really difficult to apply objective um, concepts to um, to subjective situations. I think that uh, that's really where the shadow lies. Um, I agree with you about rationality because it's completely subjective. Maybe I'd use a word uh, appropriate. Maybe that's a, a better word to use um, than rationality because obviously it's slightly less subjective. I suppose. You're on mute. Sorry. Um, please also don't take it personally. I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to say that if your method is working for you, keep going with it. It's just that I feel really weird about that word uh, in, the, in the same way that I feel really weird about the word justice uh, or, or something be just um that's kind of like something really personal for me um if it's working don't um keep going let's say uh, that's kind of like my my uh, my take on it it's if it's working keep going on it uh when it stops working then switch to something else 
Gonzo, I love you. Far too much of a nice guy for me ever to be offended. Let me tell you. Abdul. Yeah, thanks. Um, I think maybe um, uh, what I really concluded, I mean, just not concluded, but maybe something that we all aware of, but maybe we tend to not really put an extra attention towards it is that these um, virtues, I mean, stoic virtues are quite broad. Um, and I, I think I've said previously that um, the broadness of stoicism for me is, is it, I would say joyful and acceptable to a very high extent because it can fit with uh, in different context uh, contexts, um, let's say, but maybe it's hard, maybe for um, those who believes in different principles, pr different perspective, to agree with your values or with your principles because they see, for example, justice from different perspective, or they see. Um, they see um, wisdom from different perspectives uh, uh, than the others. Uh, like, uh, if you are, for example, in, 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 yeah, I don't have a good example for that, but yeah, I'll, I'll just leave it there. <laughs> It's a really interesting discussion. This makes me think of a of a um, university professor I used to have. Um, there's a um, distinction philosophers of language make between ambiguity and vagueness. So they're colloquial, like usually in in discussions, English speakers would use the terms similarly. Vague and ambiguous mean the same thing, but philosophers of language mean something very different. Um, if I, if, if there's a word that's vague, um, uh, um, it doesn't really have context and you can't really understand its meaning, um, because it's not clear what meaning it has. Um, it's not that you, there's pot, there's potential meanings it could have, and you don't know which one it is. You don't even know, it's not clear what it's even trying to say. Um, but I think what the virtues are, and I think I used the word vague before, which is wrong. I think what the virtues are are more like ambiguous, which means um, uh, it's not clear which meaning it has. So it, it is clear that it's trying to say something about um, uh, wisdom is like when they talk about the virtue of wisdom, uh, it's trying to say something about um, uh, appropriate action. Um but you're not really clear what that means. Um, so for example, it could mean um, rational action, uh, or it could mean, when you use the word appropriate, uh, it could mean uh, in line with um, cultural custom. Uh, and then you're not really sure what it really means. Or the word just could mean, um, uh, um, when when people were use use justice, what Gonzalo is saying in today's society, um, you're not clear if you're talking about um, ethically right or you're talking about um, to what proportion or degree should you uh, enforce a consequence or um, punishment on somebody uh, in proportion to what they did. That's commonly in the just in the justice system in most legal institutions today. They use the word justice kind of after the fact. You know, you did something wrong. Now let's apply justice. They don't even use justice in the sense of what's right and wrong. Um, and so I, I think these words are ambiguous. Uh, ambiguous. It's like we have all these bunch of meanings for things in the world, but we're not really sure what meaning we're actually talking about. Um, I think what would really be good, interesting is I, I know this is a very practical discussion group, but. Um, uh, in the future, at some point, we don't have to have it soon, that we have a um, uh, maybe an analytical discussion. Uh, 
um, about what the virtues really mean today. Um, and we can have a more academic discussion about what modern philosophers understand by the virtues uh, and their problems with virtue ethics. I think there's a common, there's, there's somewhat of a consensus around philosophers, I think today, uh, especially philosophers of language that um, they don't like virtue ethics because virtue ethics are, they are, are, they use the words vaguely or ambiguously. They don't, they don't really try and intend to make it clear what they mean. Um, but um, I think it just would be interesting to have a discussion like that, just thinking about the future. Um, but I really like where the discussion is going. Um, yeah, I think it's, um, I think that has a problem. Um, I'm actually trying to go on. I'm actually trying to go on and try to think about, like, I really like Tony's answer, distinguishing between the rational and irrational. I think that's a good start. But then I think after you decide how to act rationally, it's like, well, wait, wait a second. Um, is this, is this idea, is this action, okay, it's rational, but it is appropriate or is it um, good or right or, yeah. I think that's past the point of stoicism though. I think what's interesting is that I think stoicism doesn't really give us the answers to that yet. Yeah, I don't think stoicism answers that. And stoicism, the point of stoicism is not even about what's right or wrong. It's about how to, um, uh, um, it's how to first, I think the first step in ever making a right decision is making sure that decision is somehow justified or rational so that you can at least filter it through. You can't filter a right or wrong decision through without understanding that it's within your control to make it right. That's what stoicism gives us the power of doing. But I think past that point, it's not really in the, even in the, in the field of concern for Stoics. That's other philosophers' jobs. And also that right and wrong depends on the context. So it's uh, mm. creepy. Re I mean, uh, at least in Buddhism, we are some sort of forced into not thinking into black and white things. Uh, you need to remove that judgment of, of of the events. You're teach to remove them from from your brain. You have to stop using a lot of words when you're um, when you're trained into mindfulness and Buddhism in order to communicate with others. Um, So yeah, pro probably it's it's like, again, uh, stoicism, it's about practicality. It's like, I did this because I thought about that thing and that's it. It's like, and it worked or it didn't. That's it, like, kind of like, um, yeah. Gonzalo, just a, a quick question. Are there any aspects of Buddhism which you find to be irreconcilable with Stoicism? Or they, do they dovetail quite naturally? To, to be honest, um, I've read a lot about it and they kind of like overlap up until the point that nobody knows who stole who. <laughs> which one uh, was the one that inspired, let's say, the other one? Um, in, in the same way that, let's say, mindfulness and CBT, also they, they kind of like have these key components that you can track up until the point where nobody knows if this is a Stoicism or if it's Buddhism. Um, at least um, CBT is more related to the Zen aspect of Buddhism, which is more... The, the, the ramifications of Buddhism also, it's really complicated, but... Um, I usually follow the Zen one, which is the less complicated. You observe things and you try to digest them somehow um, and understand them purely by observation and practice. Um, and I think that that's, again, really sto stoic about it. Um, but, but they don't know, really, um, especially because apparently they appear at the same time. It's like I've read some um, kind of like post. Again, I have no idea if they are tr 
true or not, but they say that they appear in two different parts of the world at the same time. Uh, so it's like they don't know if it's an idea that was supposed to happen at the time or what. Mm -hmm. This sounds like um, uh, I'm just thinking of a very completely different example um, of this modern debate about um, uh, and also debate in medieval times about Newton's and Leibniz's uh, creation of the calculus and mathematics. But I think I think they also came to a similar conclusion that um, to an extent they basically created it independently. And I like to think about that in terms of uh, Stoicism and Buddhism. I like to think that they created them independently because it. Um, I think it gives the philosophies more power uh, that such different worlds could have come to similar conclusions. I think the biggest difference uh, from, from how I've understood how the Western philosophers and Eastern philosophers have written about their philosophies is that um, the language is different. I'm not just talking about literally the language, like um, uh, in one part Sanskrit and another part Greek. I'm talking about quite literally the, the 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 way in which if you translated it into the same language, they're translated very differently. Um, how the how how Buddhists speak and and write, it sounds a bit mystic and spiritual. Whereas how Western philosophers write, it sounds even when they're talking, even when Stoic philosophers, other Western philosophers talk about their um, religious beliefs and they talk about gods and spirits and fate and the divine they talk about it so rationally <laughs> they don't um they don't talk about it like a mystic and i think that's that's the only difference i can find um i mean maybe there are small details but there that's i think the big difference and i think when you choose one or the other it's um it's more of a choice about how um how it personally touches you yeah, yeah and then rather than um the conclusions it make makes uh so um we're coming to a point where i, I i'm not sure if anybody has anything else to say um or uh, uh you guys would like to further the discussion we can if you want um, but next week, I want to continue talking about the passions, but I wanted to focus on a particular passion. Um, and I wanted to focus on um, Seneca's on anger. And I wanted to focus on anger specifically. Um, if you guys would rather focus on another, another passion like grief or something like that, or focus on a select number of passions, I think it would be interesting if we focus on certain passions, um, then... Uh, passions overall. Um, that's kind of a next step and a good way to end our discussion about passions next week. Um, how do you guys feel about that? No, no pun intended, but um, just just to to clarify, we are supposed to pick between lust, fear, delight and distress. That four, those are the four, the four ones that you mentioned or we don't necessarily have to pick a um a group like uh the group of passions like lust yeah you're right lust fear delight distress like for example i was gonna I, I was um thinking about focusing on anger just because seneca wrote an entire basically a tractus or thesis on anger and i thought that would be interesting to read and to go into detail about especially because anger i think is more like lust anger greed rage those are more often discussed but if you guys would like to discuss another another passion, it could be a group, like you said, it could be a group or it could be a specific one. I have to deal a lot with anger. So for me, it will be perfect, <laughs> to be honest. Um, but um, yeah, I'm open to whatever the group says. Yeah, same thing here. <laughs> Okay, um, so next week we can focus on anger. I think there's um, uh, we'll foc we, we can read um, Seneca's on anger, um, but of course that's um, the translation is messy. It's 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 difficult reading the classics and it's difficult reading the original sources. So I'm going to try and find maybe also in addition to the original 
um, not an original, but a, a good translation of that. I'm also going to find um, a couple of sources that we can read on it. Um, and I think what will also be good is that if I can also find um, books or other other sources by necess not necessarily Stoics. Um, I know that the Stoic Fellowship, the international organization, they have some resources on their website, and sometimes they list authors um, like biographies. They list authors and biographies of um or autobiographies of experiences that people have had um, uh, and maybe going through a, a medical, um, uh, people who go through medical um, uh, difficulties through life or military difficulties through life and they have to deal with certain emotions, um, which would be good to read. Oh, uh, I just saw the link you posted. Um, what it's, what's, it, what's it about? Um, oh, it didn't uh, embed uh, properly. It's oh, uh, oh, okay. it's a uh, four and a half hours of uh, of anger by Seneca. Uh, oh wow! Okay. Oh, that's nice. An audiobook. Okay, great. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's my evening sorted. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, this is, I do this all the time. I, I just, uh, when I don't have time to read, I'll cook dinner and I'll just listen to, uh, listen to a podcast or an audio book while not, uh, dur during the whole thing. Okay. Um, awesome. Uh, and then, uh, thank you. Um, and that's the, that's the translation I've been using. I usually use their wiki sources. They have, uh, they have 1900, 1910 translations of these things. So they're not perfect. They're not the most up to date, but they're free. Um, so, and they usually have them on the other Stoics as well. If you look at Epictetus and Seneca and Marcus Aurelius. Um, so my last two questions, uh, one of them was already answered about next week. And then the other question is, um, do you have any feedback for me? Anything you'd like to see, um, uh, in the meetings, anything you think I think I can do as an organizer and, and any, any other topic you would like to do in the future as well? Yeah, I've got. Can, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead. Can we have a bathroom break in between? <laughs> I think that our two hour meetings need a bathroom break. You're not the first one who asked that, actually. Uh, <laughs> um, I forget if you were on here, Yasek. When Yasek came to a few meetings, um, he also asked for that. And for the life of me, I guess I just, um, when he stopped attending, it kind of just dropped off the radar for me. But I'll put that, I'll write that down right now just to remember. <laughs> Especially because I drink a lot of water, so yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, Tony. I was just going to say I, I've really liked the format tonight. Um, it's quite been quite interactive. Um, I think there's a danger, and this is just my view, that it can become a series of sort of mini monologues. Um, but if people can interject, um, I don't know how how to police that practically. Um, I think it makes for a more interesting discussion, more of a dialogue than, than a series of monologues. Yeah, that's my only uh, feedback. Mm, the only thing I can say is, is that there's, so there's two sides of it. Um, when, um, just if if it gets like over over six people, maybe, maybe four people was a little bit too low, but if it gets more, like more than this, more than this six, six box screen, um, I kind of have to, ask that people raise their hands only because um, if we start having a more um, interactive discussion, it um, uh, it could become chaotic and people can start building off of each other. I know we're trying to be Stoics, but uh, in real life, I don't think that always perfectly happens. Um, and um, I think sometimes if you start talking over each other, that can also cause problems. Um, I think I think that's a good limit. I think after six people, you you definitely have to raise your hand and keep them as as uh, keep them a little bit broken up. Uh, of course, you can interject and just ask wait quickly. What did, what did you mean? You can you can do things like that, but um, but with us, with maybe at most six people, 
feel free. Like I never, I never, I never try to set the tempo that um, one person has to talk before and or after another person. If you feel like interjecting and making this more of a discussion, fine. I usually try not to speak over other people because as the organizer, I try not to make sure that I'm the guy talking all the time or interjecting. So that's why I'm usually silent and I turn my mic off when I'm not talking. So if you guys want to go ahead and just run with it, I'm, I'll just sit here and watch. So please go ahead. It's yeah. Um, the only thing that I'm slightly concerned that I have to stop myself several times is that sometimes it's easy to, in this kind of interactive discussions, sometimes it's easy to say um, the only way to solve that problem is to do this. And, and kind of like, you, that's that could be harsh, let's say, from the perspective of you don't have the solutions. I mean, at this is a, a conversation about what works and what doesn't work. So I think that if we can start, if we are going to start um, having more interactive decisions, I think that we should establish some sort of rule that says, um, talk about what helped to you rather than um, how do you think that the other person should solve the problem. Um, I, I think that that also helps you. <laughs> I mean, at least it, it helps me trying to empathize more and, and say like, huh, have I been in such a situation like that one? And how did I get out of it or some sort that's of- a, That's a really good point. That meshes with what we were talking about today. I think that makes a lot of sense that like, if we are trying to practice um, all of this, that we should catch ourselves and say, wait, we may not have the right solution. This is just something in context, maybe that works for us and we can suggest it as something i think what is a good phrase is that after you propose a solution you say this is what has worked for me i think using that phrase this is what works for me or this is what worked for me establishes the fact that you're not trying to make this universal this is not the only solution that this is simply something that you in your experience you took from so yeah, I have to catch myself. I think I did that once or twice during this meeting too. But I think using that phrase will help establish that um, that we're not trying to impose a one solution uh, scenario. Yeah, thank you. Okay, guys. Um, thanks everybody for joining. Um, and I'll see you next week, four o'clock. Yeah. Great, everybody. Bye. Cheers. Have a good weekend, Bye. 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 Cheers. Bye. See you. Have a good weekend. You too. Thanks. Bye.